All right, let's talk about drafting for the theater. I'm going to take out of this lecture anything involving hand drafting. I used to talk about pencils and lead weights and how to use a T-square and all that. I want to focus just on the things that are the conventions of drafting for the theater that are true, whether you're using a pencil or a mouse to generate your drawings. Because even if you are using a computer and CAD computer-aided drafting to generate your drawings, you still need to understand what it is you're drawing. The computer can't draw it for you. Computers are great for the undo function to make lots of changes and variations and try out different ideas. You don't have to worry about smearing graphite around. It's a lot easier to assign line weights consistently. Lots of things like that that make working with a computer very efficient, which is why basically everybody is using CAD drawings. But whether you're using a pencil or a computer, you still need to understand how somebody reading your drawing needs to interpret it. So that's what we're going to focus on right now. So there's basically orthographic drawings, and there's three key sets of drawings that we're going to be dealing with. Plan views are looking straight down from above at your drawing like it was a map. An elevation is going to be looking at vertical elements, obviously walls, but also anything that's sort of vertical. And a section view is a kind of a special drawing where you're cutting through something. You're creating a cutting plane, and then you are looking at the side of that cutting plane to understand how something is built on the inside. So, for example, we might get three little drawings that look like this, that correspond with these three views in this scene. So the elevation is going to tell us the height and width of our wall. We can see the two steps there. If there was a window or trim or that sort of thing, that would appear on the elevation, on that vertical element of our drawing. Now the plan view is looking straight down at those two platforms, the 6 inch platform and the 12 inch platform. We're seeing the walls cut through and we're seeing a kind of a map view of the drawing. And then finally the section plane, there's that red plane that's cutting through that archway over there. And you can see that there is that thick outline of the area that is actually being cut through and has the gray fill. And then we're looking beyond that cutting plane at the other side of the archway, the, the inside of the doorway there on the far side. So line weights are very important in making your drawings clear, and we have to practice line weights with a pencil to get consistent line weights. And in computers it's a little easier because you can just select a line and assign a line weight to it, but you still need to know what line weight to assign. So third rank lines are really for section cuts. Now we talk about them being the theater walls and that kind of thing, architectural elements being those heavy lines, but that really is because we're using a horizontal cutting plane to cut through our theater that's uh, showing us our ground plan, that's using those heavy lines for cutting through those walls. Now, the second rank lines are for real things that you're putting on stage. So it's walls and steps and props and furniture and that kind of thing, things that can actually be interacted with. Now, that wants to be a nice bold line, nice solid line, but it doesn't want to be so thick that it, it's hard to see details. But it doesn't want to be so thin that it starts to blur in with the drafting convention lines, especially the dimension lines. So that first rank, those lightest lines, are for things that aren't real. We don't build a center line, we measure to a center line. So a dimension line, hidden lines, uh, the arc of a door swing, that kind of thing. Things that are really important for communicating what we're looking at, but are not physical things that we're going to actually build, are those first rank lines. And if the second and first rank get a little too close, it can be hard to tell what you're looking at, what's a dimension line and what's an object line. So we want to keep those two nicely separated. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is a, a pretty complicated wall. There's a couple of different planes of view going on here, but we are seeing uh, some fills. We've got some cross hatching in there. There's a lot of different line weights in there. We've got some dashed lines. It's fairly easy to see what we're looking at, but if I take all of that away, I take out the fill, I make them all the same line weight, and I get rid of all the dashes and all the information that's helping us see what we're looking at, I suspect that if I showed you this one first, you wouldn't have any idea what you were looking at. So there's a couple of different views that we're going to encounter. Of course, orthographic views are drafting views and we're going to talk a lot about those but you can also run into isometric views and perspective views so now isometric views are occasionally used on drafting it's a little difficult to draw an isometric view by hand it's fairly easy to do it with a CAD program because you just tell the computer to show something in an isometric view but you don't necessarily need it all the time especially for this like simple step unit thing we don't really even need the front view here we have all the information we need in the top view and the side view in order to build this step unit so adding in the the isometric view would just be overkill at this point. But you could include it for prop things are useful, or, or maybe if it's something fits together in a strange way that it's easier to see that three-sided view. So an isometric view shows you three sides, 
But it's not a perspective because those lines are parallel and they will go off forever being parallel. Maybe you've played an isometric video game where, again, you've got these parallel lines and it doesn't matter how far off you go off into the distance you're playing a strategy game or something. It's, it's not, there's no perspective. Nothing's getting smaller in the distance. You're just kind of moving around on this infinite chessboard plane of isometric views. Now, perspective views do have a vanishing point. They are basically what we see with our eyes or with cameras. We're seeing a perspective view in a rendering that we might show a director of how the set is going to look when it's done, but we don't really use perspective views in any kind of measured drawings because there's really nothing you can get from a perspective view. You can't put your scale ruler on any part of that drawing and pull off any useful information. All you can do is basically see what it's going to look like when it's finished, so we don't include that in the drafting. Orthographic views are only looking at one side of an object with no perspective. So we could go into the shop with a tape measure and some chalk and draw out a five foot by three foot box on the floor and then put out the little one foot spacers there for the, for the treads. And we could get a little footprint of exactly what that step unit would look like when we build it. And then we could go over to a piece of plywood and trace out that side view on there, get out our saws and cut that out and we would have half of our side of our step unit. So these are real dimensions that translate to the actual materials that we are working with. That's also true with angles as well. So we can measure and know for sure that that's a 90 degree angle. We could probably assume it was a 90 degree angle on the back of that step unit, but we wouldn't know for sure. But in an orthographic view, like the side view here, we can know for sure by putting a protractor on that and getting that for sure. We, we have no way of pulling off that kind of angle on either the isometric or the perspective view. So if we look at this little arch unit, say this is a normal 4x8 door flat here, and we're looking at it now in perspective view. So we know that all those lines are actually parallel. If this is a normal door flat, those lines are parallel, but they're not parallel here in this perspective view. They're heading off into space to some vanishing point way off to the right here. We also know that those two lines are going to be the same height. If this is a 4x8 flat, those are both 8 foot high. But look, the red line and the green line are different lengths in this perspective view. That green line is getting smaller because it's farther away from our viewpoint. And the angle, that should be a 90 degree angle if this is a normal flat, but it certainly isn't in this view. Who knows what this angle is? So we don't really get any useful information out of a perspective view. So how can we fix this? What we can do is take that flat, pull the face of that off of the front of it, turn it and lie it down on the ground, and then look straight up above at it, and then remove any kind of perspective. So we're just looking at, say, that, that piece of Luan that's now lying on the floor. We're looking straight down at that flat. Now we can outline that shape and we can put dimensions on it. We can see that, yes, now those lines are indeed parallel and those lines are parallel in the other, in the other direction and they're not going off into strange angles. And that is a 90 degree angle w between those two lines as we expect it to be. So now with this view, with this flattened out view, we actually have a meaningful drawing that we can actually get real measurements off of. Now there are plenty of times in design where we want to intentionally create crooked stuff. Architects are usually trying to go for 90 degrees and level and, and, and flat, but sometimes in theater we want to make it look like the set is sinking into the floor, or we use something called force perspective where we taper the heights of things so they're narrower at the top than they are at the bottom to make them look taller than they actually are, or any kind of strange shapes, but then in that case we would draw them on the elevation to include that. So what I did here was I, I leveled the top of them because basically they were all the same they just got cut off shorter at the bottom so to make it easy for the carpenters I took the tops of all these window units and made them all level there and that red line there is actually where the stage floor is that's where it's going to sit on the floor so if they built those shapes to those dimensions and then attach them to the floor there that angle that lean would be built into it because of the angles there at the bottom so we need to include those kind of not 90 degree angles in our elevations if we want things to have force perspective or a funny lean or something like this. Let's take a look at what a ground plan is. So a ground plan is just taking our perspective view, zooming so we're looking straight up at the top, and then taking away any kind of perspective. So we're not looking down the sides of the walls, we're just looking at the tops of everything. But this isn't quite really a ground plan because we're looking at the top of the Prasini March. We're looking at the upstairs balcony. We can't see what's underneath it. We have all these beams and things in the way. So in order to make an actual ground plan, we need to come in and create an actual cutting plane that we push down until we get to the six foot height, right, right there at the top of the actor's heads. Now we spin it over and we look at it from that top view with no perspective, and we're looking at something more like a ground plan view. Now I can take a drawing like this. This isn't quite a ground plan yet. It's, it's close, but it's not quite, because this is not a very easy document to read. 
But if we start applying drafting conventions to it, we start adding some labels and height markers and you know dashing things that need to be dashed and making things thick that need to be thick, then we can get a drawing that makes sense as a ground plan. We do the same thing with section views as well. We just kind of push the section view into the side of the drawing, right up to the center line, and then we look at it right from the side view there, and that can give us a lot of the heights of things relative to the seats and lighting positions and that kind of thing. Now we can use section views as part of a detail of a drawing as well, and a good example of that would be something like a window. So from this front view, the front elevation of this window, I can figure out how tall the window is, how wide the trim is, but I don't know how deep the trim is. I don't know how deep that window sill is or what's going on underneath it. There's a lot of information that I can't get from this front view. But if we look at a side view, if we just turn the flat 90 degrees and look at it from the side, then now I can see how far out that crown molding is and how thick the trim is, and I can understand what's going on underneath the sill there. There's that little 45 diagonal piece of trim underneath there. I've got more information, but I still can't see this window. What kind of window is it? Is it a sash window? Is it a casement window? Is it a fixed flat window? But if I create a cutting plane across the elevation there and I give it a long, short, long, short dash, just like a center line, because the center line actually is uh, a section view plane for our center line section views. So that dash line there is showing us where I'm cutting through, is if I took that flat and I dropped it on the table saw and I pushed it through the table saw right down the middle, tossed aside one half of it, and then looked at the other half, I would get a view like what's over here on the right. So I can see the all the areas that I've cut through have the thick lines and the gray fill, and then the areas that don't have the fill are the other side of the window that I'm looking at. And now I can see not only all that information that I, I was pretty sure I was getting from the side view about the, the windowsill and the thickness of the trim and all that, but now I can actually see how how the window works and I can see that oh yeah it is a sash window and I can see that the one window is in front of the other window and so on so you get more information now that you're looking at the actual section view than you could get from the other views but that center line section is a part of a drafting packet we need to hand that to a lot of people so they can figure out like how high is an actor off of the stage floor the angle for the lighting designer is important where speakers can go the trim height of the masking borders all kinds of information can come from this center line section view and these are a lot easier to generate with a CAD drawing if you build a physical model than uh, to do these by hand the, the old school way. Now with ground plans it's a little different. With architects they're basically taking their ground plan right off of a floor. So if it's a three-story house there'll be a plan view for each of the three stories and you get to those different stories by going up a staircase or by using an elevator maybe a couple of the other different ways but pretty much you're just taking the roof the lid off of a floor and you're looking down into the scene but in theater we can have all kinds of crazy floor plans right we can have different platform heights and we have this sort of staircase that kind of goes up and you know this is pretty complicated this isn't built the way that we would build a house so what we do in theater is just find this invisible cutting plane that is six foot high above the stage floor and we run this laser horizontally through all through our set and then lift up the top part and set it aside and look down at the front. So if we had a flat on stage here, we would draw a line six foot from the stage floor, and there's our actor there, which is a little bit shorter than six foot, standing next to it. Here you can see it in an isometric view. Here's our little invisible cutting plane there, six feet off of the stage floor. Well, anything sitting on the stage floor or all the way up until six feet in the air is going to be drawn like it is here. It's a thick line, and it's a gray fill. It's a solid line. So if this flat here is five feet flying five feet up in the air, it's still going to be drawn just as if it were sitting on the stage floor. It's going to be drawn as a solid line because the actor can't walk through there. They're going to have a problem if they try to walk underneath that. They're going to have to duck uh, if they're going to uh, to walk at something that's at five foot height. But if we raise it up above six feet, as soon as it goes above six feet, then we change the line to a dash line. We make it a lighter weight line and we take the fill away. That's just showing us where something overhead is in space. And now an average size actor can walk right underneath that and we have the clearance to, to say that that's now on the upper floor that's kind of upstairs now instead of down on in the area where the actor is going to walk into it you can see the same thing in this drawing here basically two different ways of handling a, a, a sign that flies into a scene so it could be above six feet and then it would look like the example on the left here where you would definitely give it a, a label in your ground plan that says train sign but it would be a lightweight unfilled dashed line indicating that it is overhead and that the actor is free to walk underneath it but maybe the the sign wants to fly in below six feet like the one here on the right in that case it's going to be drawn as a solid line and it's going to get the gray fill 
And because it's not actually touching the floor, you probably want to give the indication here, trim height 24 inches. That's letting us know that it's two feet off of the stage floor. But an actor can't walk underneath that because they're going to bump into it if they walk into something less than six feet. Now the same thing can happen in a situation like this where we have this masking flat and over here. We're down on the ground. This flat is lying on the ground up until this point where it's six feet away from this corner here. You can't walk through this. The actor can't walk through here because it's solid, but they can stand just like this figure is right here. And this turns into a dashed line. It's, it's still showing that the flat is still going on till nine feet over here. But as soon as we hit the six foot mark right there, it can turn into something that an actor can stand underneath because this is way overhead. So six foot, three inches is the lowest tip of the lowest frond there. So all of this is above the six foot mark. And here's that same unit on the actual ground plan. Now you might run into something like this, for example, maybe this is an interesting show portal where you've got a broken wall or something. Things on the floor take precedence over things overhead. So for example, this part of the plan, this is, this is how it would appear on the ground plan. And here's how it would appear in elevation. So right here from this corner to here, it's absolutely solid all the way down to the stage floor up to six feet and beyond, right? So we just draw it like any other wall. We give it a solid line, a nice thick line, give it a gray fill and make it a wall. But here it's above, but it's also below. But we're looking from this six foot height, we're no longer cutting through it anymore. We're looking down at it. So as soon as we get to this point here, we're looking at no fill. So the, thick, the thick line is still there, but there's no fill. And we get these little squiggly contour lines that are roughly corresponding to these breaks in the wall here to give us the suggestion of that. So an actor could come over here and sit on this, could step over this maybe, but they can't walk right through here because there's still wall that's touching the stage floor over here. And yes, it is above overhead as well, but that's less important, remember that's upstairs. Anything above six feet is upstairs. That's less important than the fact that it's actually down here on the stage floor. So as soon as we get to this point right here where the actual wall stops on the ground, now we can jump up to here and say, oh, okay, from here on out, this last little bit here is going to be a dashed overhead line. So this solid wall, this wall lower than six feet, and then this wall that's higher than six feet are all indicated just like this. And the same thing is true with a diagonal beam. So say you were doing something in a kind of a garret apartment or whatever, and you wanted some beams, rafters or whatever going on here. So if this was the beam, it was, it's going to be a, uh, we're looking down at the top of it at this point. So we're looking at no fill. If we really want to be fancy, we would see that there's a section cut right there. So we give it a little bit of a section cut, but then beyond six feet, it's going to turn into a dash line there, knowing that an actor can stand right here or right here in the plan view, but they can't walk through here uh, on the plan view because that's going to be lower than six feet. When you get organic things like trees, this comes up occasionally, you know, say there's a little branch here that the actor can come and sit at. So you can see that that tree seat there, it's labeled tree seat and how high it is. And it's also being shown with an unfilled but solid lines because it is a solid shape down over here, but it doesn't get a fill because we're not cutting through anything. We are cutting through the tree trunk right here, so that gets a solid fill, but we're not cutting through the roots down below here. So we've got these roots sticking out, but they're solid lines because they're down here where an actor could trip over them. And at some point though, this branch is gonna go up beyond six feet where it will turn into dashed lines. And maybe there's a canopy outline here suggesting where the, you know, the leaves are going about this point. That would be useful for the lighting designer to know about how far out these leaves go. So this is a way that you could draw this shape here uh, by just figuring out where is that six foot cutting plane. Occasionally you'll get something like this as well. And this is this can be a little useful for seeing this before we talk about doors and windows. So if you had some little wagon unit, for example, that had a wall on it and then this big cantilevered overhang on it. So for that, in this case, this stuff on the ground is more important than things overhead, just like we were looking at with that broken wall a moment ago. So this platform right here, or the orange platform here, is more important so that it gets the solid line on there. It doesn't get a fill because we're looking down at the top of it. Now the wall over here gets a fill and the solid line because we are cutting through that wall. And then the, all this is overhead, but it's perfectly in the same plane as the edge of our platform. So we don't take these and turn these into dashed lines because the platform is more important than the overhang. But over here where it doesn't matter, there's nothing else to get in the way, we start putting the dashed line overhang over here. But the platform is more important than the roof. So if the, wherever those platform, it's going to be uh, drawing those solid lines first. And then if there's no conflict, we can do the overhead dashed lines. And we can kind of see that what's that we're doing here with this idea of of 
how to draw an archway. So if we look at this archway here and we drop the top of that, we sort of just drop the inside of that and then we look down from above and then we take away any perspective. So that's basically how we got to this point. So now draw an outline around the parts of the archway that are actually going all the way to the floor. So these are these are walls here, right? These are two kind of columns and across the middle here is a little bridge that we can actually walk between these two. So here I want to dash the edge of those because this is all sort of one face here on our archway here the front and the back so here it becomes a dashed line because you can walk underneath this arch you can't walk through here or walk through here or come in here and walk this way but you can walk underneath this now if this were just a slab floating in space it would have a dashed line all the way around and these two column pieces wouldn't be there so we would just see this dashed line just like that train sign floating overhead but because this little bridge connects to the walls this line here becomes more important than the dashed line that it's covering up because the this is down under six feet where an actor could actually lean up against this. And then just to finish this for the drawing, we could take and fill this in with some gray, or we could go old school and put in some cross hatching in there. But this is basically how we would show an archway in a scene. So we get the same idea here. If there's if it's just a gap in the in the wall, there's nothing overhead, you just draw two flats and leave it alone. And you can just walk right through them. But as we just showed, if there is something over six feet here, we will show this over six feet part here as a dashed line. Now, if it turns into a doorway, it's the same thing. All we need to do is add the doorway, and then we put this little arrow, this little uh, arc with an arrow on the end of it to show which way the door swings. Just show it you know, 90 degrees open, and there's our door. And if it opened up the other direction, we could show it swinging that way. Now, windows are a little different because windows, unless it's a French window, which is basically a door, right? Uh, it's going to have the window, the opening in the wall, but it's also got a solid area down below here. So that's why this is shown as a solid line all the way across, front and back. And then we draw this line in the middle there to suggest where the window is or the pane of glass is. Now, the bigger the scale drawing, the more detail you can get in. But if you're just doing a quarter inch ground plan, that's a perfectly good way to show a window. And it's a window because this is a solid line here instead of a dash line, like the archway over here. Because unlike the window, there's nothing down here to stop us from walking through that archway. But this little piece of wood down here, or plaster or sheetrock or whatever it is, this right here is keeping us from walking through here. And so it's shown as a solid line. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the steps you might do in starting your own ground plan. Now, you don't have to do them in this order, but this is kind of a logical way, especially if you're doing something like the realistic interior that I'm going to show you right here. You might start by adding in your platforms and your walls and any major elements. Maybe if it was a, a more presentational kind of design, you might add whatever element was really defining the space. So maybe it's some painted drops or it's some twisted fabric or it's a giant water slide or you know, whatever it is, whatever the major element is in the space is typically a, a good place to start. And then you can come in by, if, it's, if it is a realistic interior, add your doors and windows where those need to be. Think about where the entrances and exits need to be. Add in major set prop objects. So that's going to be furniture. You don't have to worry about every single little bit of hand prop sort of thing, but maybe things like telephones, that kind of thing. That can be important for blocking reasons. But for the most part, we're thinking about where things are. And then a very important step is to add labels to anything that might be unclear. So that sofa there, we probably could guess that was a sofa, but we're not entirely sure until we get the word sofa. But also realize that you can do things like this tea table over here. So we've got tea table. It doesn't say tea table, chair, chair, right? Because that little curved shape with the little back on there, it's pretty simple, but showing it tucked under the circle and the, you know, we can pretty much figure out that those are chairs with that tea table. Same thing with the ottoman here that it's going in front of this armchair. We can take that shape that by itself, we would have no idea what that is. Is it a card table? What is it? You know, but because it's this armchair and the label is going across both pieces, we can see this as armchair and ottoman. So you don't need to go crazy with labels, adding too much information, but anything that's unclear needs to get those labels. Notice the way that the word rug is sitting right here on the edge of the rug. It's breaking the line here. It's not just floating around in space. Same thing is going on. I mean, the word stool is just impossibly big for that little circle there, but the fact that it's kind of stuck on like a little label. Same thing with the drafting tape, the bookcase, the armchair, all these are, you know, this is just using a white fill in your little text block and dropping on like a sticker. That's a very useful way to uh, apply labels. Labels. And if it's just impossible for it to fit, then just do a little arrow, point at something, and just give it a, a name off to the side. Then we're going to want to label entrances and exits. That's very important, again, for blocking reasons. So everyone knows that, oh, okay, offstage right is the garden, and offstage left is the kitchen, you know, and rather than the reverse. 
Then you're going to want to check your sight lines. You're going to want to find your worst seats. Kind of usually it's you know the first and last seats in the front row, but not always. And then you're going to try to figure out where masking needs to be by looking through sort of holes in the set. Even a play that's very Brechtian and very kind of minimalist, and oh, I want to see the line sets and I want to see the backstage wall or whatever. You probably don't want to see the prop table. Probably don't want to see the quick change booths. So there's going to be some kind of masking, even in a very exposed show. But in a realistic interior where we're trying for realism here, we're going to want to figure out well how far does our our masking need to go to keep us from seeing the prop table and the quick change booths. Maybe we would just go so far as to add actual walls to it. If we have areas like this where there's a lot of seats they're going to be able to see over here, we'll just add a couple of extra walls to it. Maybe soft goods like the legs will be enough. We can also see well, how far are people are going to see through a window for the painted drop that we're adding as a backdrop. So how big does that backdrop need to be? It needs to be at least big enough to where this sight line isn't going to go shoot past it. So we've got a little extra room to spare here. We're fine. Also notice too that the psych and the drop here have the line set that they are attached to indicated right here on the ground plan. And if you have things that are moving around in your scene in different positions, so this is a view of the act one of this play, and there's a garden wagon here that's going to come in in act two. So because it's living right here in act one, this is the act one position, it's solid lines. It's not thick lines, but it is a solid line showing where it's parked in the wings. However, this little alcove unit that's now on stage right now is going to park over here in act two, and it's not there right now. Nothing's there right now, so it's being shown as a phantom line, as a dashed line, showing that this so we'll move into that position and this wagon will take its place in Act 2. And of course you can add notes for any kind of clarity. So anything that won't fit on your drawing you can just say C Note 2 and then over here you can say something about what you're pointing at. Or if it's things like the fact that the stage floor will be covered with quarter inch masonite. That's a universal note that's like where are you going to put that? I guess you could sort of like point to the front of the stage or something. But it's perfectly fine to add it to the notes because the technical director is going to read through your notes before they start doing anything else. And of course you can add your title block and the information that goes into that. We're also going to add the height marker. So this little plus seven inches is letting us know that we step up seven inches to get to that platform. Some things that are true of all drafting plates, they all need to have a border. Typically that's going to be half an inch away from the edge of the paper, but if you're using a smaller piece of paper, you can get away with a, a little bit tighter border, maybe a quarter inch or something. But you want to include a border because you want the person looking at it, who's getting a printout or a photocopy or maybe even an old school blue line, they want to know that they are looking at the full plate, that they haven't had anything cropped out of it, that they're missing some information. So don't have anything touch the border except the title block. The title block can park right up against this bottom right hand corner but you don't want your center line going over the border or your seats or whatever make sure that you've got nice clearance around your border now you don't need to have a giant piece of paper and a tiny drawing in the middle of it. So if it's if this is your piece of paper and this is your drawing, then change your scale and make it a little bit bigger or use a smaller piece of paper. It doesn't doesn't need to have all this wasted space around it. The title block always needs to be in the lower right hand corner. There's lots of different styles of title block. There's no official kind of title block, but it does want to be attached to this lower right hand corner, largely because we need the plate number to be kind of like a page number. So if you think about the drawings for a big architectural project, there might be dozens of plates of drafting. And even in a good sized theater set of drawings, you might get like the teens, you know, 12, 14, 16. It's not unusual. So you want to be able to flip through the plates here by looking in this lower right hand corner. You don't want your title block to be jumping around into different positions or be in a place where you have to pull out the entire sheet to see what you're looking at because you're looking for a particular piece of drawing and you want to be able to flip through it down here in this corner. Now you can put the title block in a different orientation. So this is typically the way that I do it using the black box because I can run it up the side of the drawing here and that makes it nice and tidy. But again, that number is down in that right hand corner. The information that goes on it is, the shape of it is kind of up to you, but the basic information that needs to be on a title block for a, a theater production is the venue or producing company. So in this case, it's Third Rail Reps at the Winningstad Theater. Uh, the name of the show, of course, is going to be on there. And you can get clever with, you know, I, sometimes I will do a little interesting font and then save that as an image and then drop it there on the title block. You don't have to just use plain old text. Then, of course, you're going to talk about what the name of the plate is. In this case, it's the Act 1 ground plan. 
the scale, of course, half inch to the foot. Now, if you have a plate of details, for example, where you have lots of different drawings on there with different scales, here you can put as noted. So scale as noted. Um, and then typically you put the director, your name is the designer, and then the technical director there as well. And then the date is important. You want to know, especially if there's different versions, as there frequently is, different versions of drawings. You want to know which drawing you're looking at, which version. And then the plate number is going to go down there in that lower corner like we've talked about. Your drawing must have a center line right wherever the center line of the space is. So you're going to just put the center line that is indicated on the master plans of the drawing down. And that's going to be a long, short, long, short dash because it actually is a, a section view. If you're working in a black box or a non-traditional space, you can just do a center line that's a crosshairs between the two different walls here. So equidistant between this wall and equidistant between this wall is this point. The height of objects the actors are going to stand on are important for blocking and sight lines and all kinds of things, but we're only dealing with things that are being stood upon. I can't stress this enough. People really misunderstand this. When we're on a ground plan, the only dimension, with one or two exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, that we need to put on a ground plan are the cumulative inch heights of things that the actors are going to stand on. So unless they're, you know, if you're doing cabaret and you know that Sally Bowles is going to jump up on the table and sing a song on that table, that turns it into kind of a platform, and then you can put a height marker on that. Or if there's a window seat or some kind of bench or low wall or something that you know is, is intended to be stood upon, the reason why it's there in the design is, is, a, is a kind of an alternative platform, then great, include the height markers on that. But you do not put them on top of walls, on top of furniture, on top of things that aren't going to be stood on. So in this case, we're looking at cumulative inches. So 6 inches, 12 inches, 18, and 24 for each of those little steps up there. They're shown in cumulative inches. This is the only kind of dimension that is done this way. And then on a plan view, it's going to look like this. It's going to be plus 24, not plus 2 feet. And you're going to start off somewhere with a 0 inch mark. So you're going to have some point that is the stage floor. And you just give, give ourselves a, a datum line to start with. And then anything above that is going to be cumulative inches above that stage floor. Or if you have steps going down, they start turning into negative numbers. So in this case, the actors step down 6.5 inches to that first step as they're working their way toward the house floor. So platform heights are indicated in those feet and inches, and they're only for things that people stand on. So if you get those two things down, then you'll, you'll be great with those platform heights. You want to place the height marker near the center of the platform or in some logical place. So like this plus 16 inches here, that's not the center of the platform. That's over here somewhere maybe, but this makes more sense. 0, 8, 16, 24, 32. You know, there's kind of a nice little flow to that. Those all make logical sense about where those go. The platform heights below the stage floor are described in negative numbers, as we've talked about before. So here's stepping down from the stage, the permanent stage floor, down to a platform lower than the stage floor out here in the house. These little X's you will sometimes see those are fine to use on a platform plan if you're trying to figure out the the major massing but you don't need to include these x's on a regular ground plan the only time that you would do that is if the platform plan was so complicated that it was kind of hard to tell where the, the levels were you could put those little x's on there to make it easier for the eye to see a contiguous level but this is pretty simple these little four platforms here are not complicated enough to really warrant that. And then of course when we get into stairs, we'll talk about stairs in a little, great, little greater detail here, but we don't need to, to label the height of every single step. So if, we were, if there are regular steps, or if it's just like two little steps over here, sure, you can put these little height markers on there, but you don't need to put plus eight, plus 16, plus, you know, on, on every single little step. What you can do is use this indicator 8 over 10, and I'll explain what that means here next. So when we're dealing with stairs, the rise, we talk about the rise and run of stairs. So the rise is how high each step is, and the run is how far does each step run, how deep is each step. So if these treads are 12 inches deep, and they climb 8 inches high, then the rise and run is 8 over 12. So just simply putting 8 over 12 on your drawing says stairs 8 over 12 means this regular kind of stairs. This is a fairly common size stair, 8 inch over 12 inches. Typically 8 inches is the residential height of a stair. Anything more than 8 inches starts to feel pretty steep. Anything less than say 6 inches is going to feel kind of weird to walk on. But you know 8 over 12, 8 over 10, 8 over 11, that kind of thing, 7 and a half and 11, anything in that kind of range there is fine. Um, but this is pretty pretty common, this 8 over 12. And then to find out how high things are, just count how many steps you have, and then multiply by the height. And they really should be the same height. You should not have staircases where that rise is different, because that makes it really dangerous and difficult to walk up a staircase. Even like a quarter of an inch difference, we can feel that ergonomically as we're walking down a staircase. So we'll say this is an 8-inch high rise there, so 
8 times 8 is 64, or 5 foot 4 inches. But don't forget, you oftentimes are stepping up onto a platform or landing. There might be one more step there. So in this case, it actually is 6 feet high, 9 times 8, which is giving us 72 inches. And then stack levels are kind of an interesting thing. So if you have pieces, this is not unusual to have a staircase going up to a balcony level with part of the stage visible underneath it. Now, if this was a wall here coming straight down from this upper balcony and, and this woman would, would be actually backstage at the, where she's standing there, it'd be a little bit different. You can kind of get away of just drawing one plan view. But as soon as you have something underneath the, the level above, you're going to have to, to address that in your ground plan. So one of the ways that we can do that is drawing a staircase that says, all right, here are the stairs, 8 over 10, so they're rising 8 inches, they're going 10 inches. We're, we've got a landing here. It's nice to add a height marker on a landing because very oftentimes people are going to be standing on a landing to give a big speech or whatever. You know, people are going to pause here for a while and use it as a platform. So giving a height marker on there is a good idea. And now this is going up to a landing that continues past this brake line. And this little squiggly line, and sometimes you can do it with a little S, kind of looks like a dollar sign without the, the, uh, the middle bit. Um, that little brake line is just saying, this is going on but I'm going to stop drawing it right now. And you can do that for anything that you want. Anytime you want to just sort of break something to, to tell people that it continues to go, but you're not drawing it anymore, you can just put this little break line on here. And then we, what we can end up with is something that looks like this. So this is our main ground plan, our first floor ground plan. Here's our staircase going up to our landing, and then it's going up to the balcony above. Here's the break line where the wall is. So these are all items on the first level. So there's a cellar door down here on the first level, and there could be another door stacked directly above it on the second floor here. But we can't show them both at the same time, so we have to pick the one that's on the level that we're on. Same thing with a prop that's down here on the stage floor. This post here is supporting this balcony up above. So we show the balcony level being dashed for this upper level, but the post goes all the way to the stage floor. An actor can lean up against this post down below. It's holding up this level by connecting to the stage floor. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be doing a very good job of holding the balcony level up. But because it drops down below six feet, we draw it just like any of the other walls, solid and with a gray fill. But we have a dash line for where that balcony is upstairs. So now we can look at that upstairs landing and we can see here's where our stairs pick up. So we're going to draw this somewhere else on our plan. So if there's room on your ground plan to put it, you know, up backstage somewhere, great. Otherwise, you may have to put it on a second plate of drawings. If it's a really big second level, it's probably worth uh, another plate of drawing. But here's where our stairs pick up again. See, there's the other side of our break line. Now it's the stairs going down from this level. So we're coming up here to this, this eight foot height level. So plus 96 is eight feet. Here's the railings over our balcony level. Here's the hall door upstairs that's directly above the cellar door below it. And there's a wall sconce and a plant and another door over here. There's all this information that if we put this all on the same drawing, we would have no idea of knowing is the wall sconce upstairs or downstairs? Is the Where's the sideboards over here? It would become very very confusing trying to show these both at the same time. So we box this out in a little breakout and we give it a name upstairs landing plan and if it fits somewhere and there's some blank room on our ground plan, great. Otherwise you need to put it on another drawing. So here's an example of the main ground floor level here and I was able to rotate the second level here. This is noises off so it's got two, two floors rotated it and just tucked it over here. There's enough room off to the side here where I was able to show the second level, the upstairs of the plan, off to the side of the same plate of drawing. You can't always do that, but in some, some cases you can get lucky. Now, you don't always move between stairs. Oftentimes we can use ramps. So here's a section view, a side view of a different kind of ramps and how you would draw them in plan view. So if you have like a, a wheelchair ramp, so you could go up with, on, on skates, you could come up this, this ramp and go to a eight inch high platform level from the stage floor, for example. And you could just simply say ramp up and this is all you need to do. You give it a height right here where it's starting from, in this case zero, the stage floor, and it's going up to a platform that's eight inches high, and there's a solid line right here because there is a break right there. This is where the platform starts, and this is where it goes to an angle change right there, and that's where we show that. This is where the ramp stops and the level platform picks up again. Now, this is exactly the same, except there's a step up to the ramp. You can't go up on your on your roller skates anymore. You have to step up to this. And that first step is eight inches high. And then you go up the ramp to a 14 inch high platform above it. So that same on this end it looks pretty much the same, but we add this little height marker onto the ramp to show that the bottom of the ramp is a step up first. 
And then here it's a step up in both directions. So here we step up to eight inches, we go up our little ramp, it's 14 inches here at the top of our ramp, and then we step up again to 22 inches. So we go up another step right here, so that line is indicating that the ramp stops and that we go, we're not just going over the edge there, we're actually stepping up again here to this new height. Now those are all for straight ramps, which is usually what we're dealing with, but occasionally you might have an organic, organic shaped kind of ramp. And here we just use simply contour lines. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So we're going from zero, in this case we would say slope up, and the, and the spacing of the contour lines is suggesting how steep it is. So they're more tightly spaced down here at the bottom, and they get less tightly spaced as they go, as, as it sort of levels out over here, and it takes us up to our 14 inches. And there's still a hard edge right there, so we see that corner is still being shown as a, as a solid line. But this is a completely organic shape here. We would just give the footprint of the organic shape, and maybe we would pull out some key heights here. We would say, well, the top is about 30 inches, and this little area here is about 20 inches. It's not going to be exact because it's kind of a rough shape, but it's, you know, in the ballpark of uh, 20 inches and then a foot over here. And then again, the con combo contour lines are really close together to show there's a step here, a couple more for this little bit here. It's not quite as steep as this first one, and then a few spaced out ones to show this little incline, and now we're up here at the top. So that same kind of idea of using the sort of rings and shading thing is very useful for a lot of things. You could suggest a log uh, here by putting in some parallel lines around it to suggest a cylindrical shape of an object, a tree stump, something like that. Uh, we've already talked about how the branches uh, over, of an overhead tree are dashed lines. And then here's just another example of an organic kind of contour line showing how uh, rocks and mounds and sand dunes and whatever that you might have on stage. So in this case, we would look at this contour map and we would know this is fairly steep on this side. We wouldn't want to climb the mountain this way. It'd be a lot easier if we went around this side to these very gradual bits and went around that way. So if you're not familiar with what contour lines are, maybe you've seen these kind of maps here, like a trail map or something like that. Each one of those little brown and red lines there are indicating uh, an elevation height here. So we can see this is a mountain peak over here, and there's another one over here, and then we've got this little sort of creek valley down here in the middle where the trail goes, right? So that's helping us visualize three-dimensional space, kind of like this here. Each time it goes up a thousand feet, we get another contour line in here. So we could basically kind of slice this up. So we could do the same thing with a unit. So we had a set that look, set piece that looked like this. We had an interesting platform that had a very organic shape on it. Well, if we looked at that from front view, we could go across and just like every foot put a little a cutting plane in there. So from the side view, it would look like that. So we've got these little red cutting planes in there. And if we cut through our weird platform, each at each one of those one foot high marks there, we could then float those apart there. So you can see now we've got every one of those little pieces is a foot thick. And then we could put the little red line there along the edge where our cuts are. Now, if we go back to our top plan view, you can see where those little red lines are. That's letting us know that's where that shape crosses the one foot mark. So there's a little tight, steep bit here, and there's a little flat area over here, and there's this one little plateau right at the beginning there. So we can get those shapes, and then we could transfer that onto a ground plan and get rid of all those grays and things, and just transfer those contour lines across. The outline is going to be a little heavier than the contour lines, but this is going to basically show us that we're dealing with a, a roughly organic shape. And you could put even finer ones in here just to help uh, create the shape a little bit more. Remember, the drafting, anything like that, anything like, like how, how do I draw a sand dune? What's the, the convention for drawing these weird things? It's just a drawing with no perspective. So if you don't know how to draw something, just think about what it would look like with no perspective from the top. So an ice box, you know, this is a stove over here, a sink, a phone, right? This is a chair. It's not really a very descriptive chair, but it's enough to show, oh yeah, that's a chair. So you don't, there's no, there's no universal symbol for a steamer trunk, for example. So, but there's the steamer trunk and I've labeled it trunk there because it's, you know, this is just two rectangles and there's two little tables pushed together. Well, here, because of the label, we can see that's a steamer trunk. But just think about, well, how is it going to look in its top plan view? I've done sets like this one. This one I did, did a few years ago. The whole set was stacked of tables and lamps and they just sort of moved around the tables and lamps throughout the show and so how do you draw that in a grand plan well you just draw what it looks like from above beds and tables and lamps and you know there's these height markers on here because actors were standing up on some of these tables and actually singing from some of those and then we have some traditional kind of platforming and things down here on the front edge of the stage but this is a ground plan for a, a set without any real set it was just a giant stack of props basically that created this, this design but you can still show that in a plan view 
And then just cl please clearly label all the objects and exits in your plan. We talked about this already, but if you include the labels that you need on, on your plan view, it makes it so much easier to read than trying to guess at what things are. And then the lettering, again, this is more hand drafting, but lettering must be in all caps, neat and clear, try to keep your size consistent. And that's true even with the font sizes. You don't want to change your font size every, you don't want eight point font over here and 12 point font and 16 point font. Just keep it all the same. If it's the same kind of note, make it the same font size. Keep on the 90s or aligned to an object. So if you're if you're uh, writing at the, the label on something, you can point to an object. You can get a little fishtail arrow at it. You can write right on top of it. But what you don't want to do is kind of just scribble onto it. And again, it's harder to do on, on the computer than it is in hand drafting. But I see this all the time in hand drafting where people just kind of write in lowercase and they just sort of like, you know, write a little note on it that's kind of floating away from the shape. And that's not what we want. And don't forget to include masking, your psych, your soft goods, backstage info, where doors are, backstage doors, all that stuff is probably going to be on the plan that you get, certainly the plan that you're going to get in this class. And then consider adding a notes section to clarify things in your plan. You can get a lot of information in a notes section. And I want to talk briefly for a second about dimension lines because I've got a, another video that's just about how dimension lines work. Um, but just to talk about the way the convention that we're using, we're only using that cumulative inches for the things that actors are standing on. Every other dimension that we will generate will use the foot dash inches convention. So here we have the height of this little door flat is eight foot dash zero inches. And we say zero inches if it's a whole foot, but we don't ever say uh, zero feet dash nine inches like we have down below here. It's just nine inches. We don't we don't include the the, the uh, zero feet, but we do include zero inches after a foot. And remember, the apostrophe is foot and the quotes are inches. And if you get that right with a dash to separate them, you'll be fine and you won't have a tiny little stonehenge. So we've got our four by eight flat here. We've got these nested dimensions. You always want the larger dimension on the outside outside with the smaller dimensions on the inside. We'll talk more about that in the drafting uh, the dimension tutorial specifically. If it's too small to fit inside of an area, you can include a little leader line that points to where dimension needs to be. And if it's the if it's off by itself here, you can also have a, a number that's sitting by itself. I would also consider, I uh, can show you in class how to set your dimensions right on the line. This is the way I prefer to do it. It takes up less room and it makes it much less confusing as to what dimension is associated with. So if we look back here at this one, it's like, wait, four foot is, wait, which one is it here? If it's only two, it's pretty easy, but if you get a big deep stack of, of nested dimensions, this can be very confusing. But as soon as you place them right on top of the line, there's no question that this one's four foot, that one's two foot six, and it'll make a lot more sense that way. And then typically linear dimensions are not required on a plan view. The two examples where that is, is the case or is not the case is something like a passerelle for like a, an area around the, the, uh, the orchestra pit, for example. Everyone's going to want to know how wide that is. The, the choreographer is going to want to know how wide. The director is going to ask six times. Just put it on the, on the drawing. Or if you have something on your drawing that's really unusual, you're doing um, Alice in Wonderland or something, and you've got a tiny little door, and it looks like a normal door on the, on the plan view, but you want to make a notation that says, you know, this door is only 16 inches wide, right? She's supposed to squeeze through this door, and that's the reason why it's much smaller than a normal door. Don't forget how small it is, because you're not going to be able to bring that prop table through or whatever as if it were a normal door. And then just to wrap up here, if you want to learn more about this, there's the USITT, the USIT Standard Graphic Guidelines, you can download this at this link or just search for use it drawing guidelines and this is a very short little handout there's four pages of images that give you this kind of stuff and basically it's the things that I've been talking to you about here um, there's just a little bit of a, just a kind of a key for common things that you're gonna need to draw if you want more than that there's a lot of books um, my graduate school professor was Dennis Dorn here who was the co-author of drafting for the theater and he's also the guy who came up with these uh, drafting convention certainly you can download this it's free and it's like four pages. Here's what they look like. This is one of the four pages and this is just going through and telling you. This is just kind of a key that's pretty straightforward that can tell you what these things mean and they're not that complicated. So I would encourage uh, checking out that as well. So that's enough to get you started, enough to get you into trouble and don't forget that if you're not sure how to draw it, just think what it's going to look like from above and go for it. So good luck.